This is Channel 253. In this episode of Nerd Farmer. And this is a good opportunity for all people in Azerbaijan and Armenia to realize it and finally sit down at the table and say, look, we fought and enough is enough. That's it. Let's leave it in the past. We don't want any more martyrs. We want peace. It's doable. Did you know Channel 253 is member supported? I'm producer Doug Mackey, and I hope you will show your support by going to channel253.com slash membership and join. Thank you. This is the Nerd Farmer Podcast, a national conversation through a local lens. Welcome to the Nerd Farmer Podcast. My name is Nate, and I'm your host at Tacoma Abroad. Uh, today, we have a conversation that is leaping from my newsletter onto the podcast. Uh, I've been writing a newsletter since November called Takes and Typos. You should subscribe. And in it, I basically document things that are happening in my life, things that I'm reading or interested in. And in a recent newsletter, I wrote about my trip to Azerbaijan. Uh, I had a long weekend, and I visited Baku, and I found the country quite enjoyable. Uh, Most Americans don't know a lot about Azerbaijan. If I'm keeping it 100, I didn't know a lot about Azerbaijan. But during my travels, one thing I heard about a lot from Azeris was the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a disputed region uh, between or within Azerbaijan or Armenia, depending on your point of view. And so you know me, I had questions, and so I found an expert. So I would like to welcome my guest, Savinch Asmenguza, to the show today. Savinch, how are you? Thank you very much, Nate. Thanks for having me. Uh, So I was fascinated by my time in Azerbaijan. I think Azeris are some of the most interesting people that I've ever encountered in travels. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to be like the Bureau of Tourism for Azerbaijan. That's not your role here. But I'm just wondering if you could, could you give listeners a sense of Azerbaijan's geopolitical situation and like what makes it a unique state? Well, it's, uh, it's, Probably geopolitically, it's uh, kind of sandwiched between two not particularly friendly neighbors, Russia from the north and Iran from the south, which really uh, sets the tone of uh, diplomacy, of ongoing issues and challenges. Uh, It also neighbors with Armenia that uh, it had conflict with for decades. Uh, we fought two wars with Armenia. First one, uh, Armenia won, and second one, uh, recently 2020, Azerbaijan won and was able to um, return uh, most of its occupied territories. Um, so other than that, so it's a very complicated neighborhood. <laughs> no, it, it very much is because the other issue that I found, so the way you describe it is how I experienced it, but also there's the idea that Azeris are Turkic people. And so there's like the influence of like Turkish culture. Uh, in fact, many of the people who I was speaking to were saying, so like in English, we have this distinction. We say somebody's Turkish. That means they're a citizen of Turkey or they're Turkic, which means they belong to the Turkic people group. Correct. And I noticed that in English, Azeris don't make that distinction. They call themselves Turkish as well. It's a Turkish, uh, absolutely. Azerbaijani language is a part of Turkic language, language groups. So uh, 90% or maybe perhaps even more is the same, is uh, generally understood. And obviously there are uh, cultural, linguistic ties between Turkey and Azerbaijan. Um, so therefore, uh, as Turkey has been traditionally an ally um, of, of Azerbaijan, and that did not change. Uh, So the reason why I wanted to have you on the show today is to help me understand the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. And you kind of gave away one thing that I was curious about when you said the Azeris were able to reclaim territory in uh, 2020. Can you talk for a little bit about what Nagorno-Karabakh is and why it is an area in the flashpoint of conflict? Well, I think uh, the uh, conflict, which... uh as we know, as we remember, it started in 1990s. Uh, It was the time, uh, and and Russia played a very important role from the very beginning. Uh, 
I think Russia is the major player in this, and I would even say a party to the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been arming Azerbaijan against Armenia. Russia has been arming Armenia against Azerbaijan. So as Russia is, has been interested in having this conflict going uh, for decades. Uh, it calls itself a um, peacemaker or mediator. It has never been such. Uh, it's interested in having some interim declarations of cooperation, negotiations, so on and so forth. But it has never had this intention to have this conflict resolved. So unfortunately, for decades, uh, I don't think whether population people in Azerbaijan or Armenia were uh, really aware of it. Uh, because, you know, you are fighting Armenians. Uh, Russians have nothing to do there, correct? Sure. Or Armenians are having the same feelings. But I think it has been uh, more clear, first of all, with the Second War and especially afterwards. Uh, I don't think uh, mood in Azerbaijan or Armenia is the same that's been there 30 years ago. You know, recently I had an interesting poll in my YouTube channel, and I asked a simple question. I asked, which country do you think represents a threat to Azerbaijan or threat comes to Azerbaijan? You would think that probably people would vote for Armenia. Uh, but interestingly, 5,000 people voted and viewers, and 86% said Russia, 8% said, said Iran, and only 2% said um, Armenia. Hmm. This, is, this is really interesting. This is what people in Azerbaijan think. I, I'm not sure, but I do think that people in Armenia also think that or guess that. At least their expectation of Russia changed drastically after the Second War. So whatever are the reasons, I think people in Armenia are also coming to understand that uh, we have to speak to, to each other, to Azerbaijan and Armenia. If we do rely, if we continue to rely on Russia, that Russia will be peacemaker, that will solve the conflict, that would mean more wars. So going back to your question, why do I think that there was, I think it was in Kremlin's plans from the very beginning to have mm. kind of an enclave uh, inside the territory of Azerbaijan, uh, which would mean a timed bomb that this conflict would inflare whenever it wants to. Uh, and whenever it wants to, it would come uh, as, as a peacemaker, uh, you know, with a ceasefire, so on and so forth. So I, even though Azerbaijanis and Armenians were fighting each other for decades, and, you know, I myself lost my father in the first Karabakh war. So even though we were fighting each other with Azeris and Armenians, I do think that Russia was had the utmost important role in this conflict. That's fascinating. Um could you help me get smarter about the current uh, Azeri regime? Uh, talk us through who the leadership in Azerbaijan are and how they came to power. Well, uh, father transferred his power to son. Uh, he was about to die in the hospital, the uh, older Hagar Oliev, president. And his death was not announced to Azerbaijan. He was, by the way, in the United States in Cleveland Clinic. Oh, interesting. Yes, and uh, the the government uh, here were telling that he's alive. He said that he's his messages that he thinks of you. He signed some kind of degrees. So for months, uh, his situation was not made public to Azerbaijan. And after that, the power was transferred to his son, uh, who had no experience in governance, in politics. He was made some vice president of oil company just mm -hmm. before that. Uh, so after, and then there were uh, falsified elections, presidential elections conducted in Azerbaijan. His son was made president with the support of Russia, Russian's regime. And only after that, death of the father, Ali, was announced. So it was father to son. This is how Ilham Aliyev came to power in Azerbaijan exactly 20 years ago, in 23. Huh. So what something I find interesting is, is uh, 
I, I was talking with you and Doug before hit record about how when I was in Baku, I visited the Presidential Museum. And the museum is named after the founding president, the one you mentioned who passed away in the United States. And his hold on the country goes back to pre-independence. He basically was put in charge of Azerbaijan back when it was a Soviet state. Something that the museum talked about that I would like to know more about is, is you mentioned this conflict goes back to the 90s, but is not the conflict older than this? And basically the Soviets uh, wouldn't let the Azeris and Armenians fight it out and they kind of like, like pacified the situation? Well, it depends how you look at it. Uh, obviously, okay. if you go like a century before uh, 1918, when uh, Republic of Armenia, First Republic of Azerbaijan, First Republic of Georgia were formed, obviously there were issues there. Uh, mm. Which country Nagorno-Karabakh was part of? Uh, what was the population consisted of? Obviously, like today, there are no Azeris left in Karabakh. And this is because of the policy of Ilham Aliyev. But there were times when Azeri population uh, dominated, prevailed in Karabakh. There were more Azeris than Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh like a century ago. So it's been something uh, Stalin's uh, uh, policy was to have those enclaves in post-Soviet uh, countries. Um, it, it goes to Moldova. There was Transnistria, for instance. Uh, same about Georgia, like they have Abkhazia, Southern Ossetia. So these are the potential hotspots. Uh, so timed bombs. Uh, people live together. They don't experience any problems. But whenever there are government changes, uh, policy changes, for instance, collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Gorbachev himself was struggling uh, with uh, Yeltsin. So power struggle in Moscow. So whenever uh, Moscow wanted, decided, it's been using this. Um, so for instance, in Azerbaijan, in Karabakh, for instance, who does Karabakh belong to today? Um, <clears throat> it's uh, internationally recognized Azerbaijan's territory. Can Azerbaijanis go to Karabakh? Uh, can President Aliyev go to Karabakh? No, uh, it's Russia's. Uh, de facto, the euro it is Azerbaijan's, but de facto, it's Russians. It's Russian soldiers there. Uh, Aliyev invited two thousand so Russian soldiers there. Now, for some reason, sources say there are five times more soldiers. But of course, that was before Ukraine aggression against Ukraine started. So, um, therefore, I think we shouldn't be kidding ourselves. Neither Armenians or ourselves. Karabakh is Russia's. Russia is trying to create a second uh, Crimea there. Uh, one day, maybe 10 years from now, maybe sooner, maybe later, they will proclaim uh, Karabakh to be an independent country or annex it to Russia, just as Putin did it in Ukrainian territories, just as Rus Russian uh, Putin did it with Crimea or Zaporozhye or uh, Donetsk or Lugansk uh, so-called uh, people republics in Ukraine. So this is potentially second uh, Crimea within territory of Azerbaijan. So I think population of Azerbaijan understands that, but same goes with the people of Armenia probably, but because the government in Azerbaijan is not democratically elected, mm -hmm. does not represent the will of Azerbaijan and has very questionable ties with Putin regime, which involves huge corruption, etc., therefore he just turns he just turns blind eye to the situation, pretends that he doesn't realize it, and um, interacts with Russia as if Russia can seriously be a peacemaker, that aggressor, that this crime perpetrator, as if he can be a peacemaker when it comes to Nagorno Karabakh. I'm just really struck by what you said about Russia's peacekeepers coming in and actually not being peacekeepers and never leaving. Uh, because earlier on in the year, so one of the reasons why I went to Azerbaijan is, is that earlier on in the year, I went to Tbilisi and visited Georgia. And I spoke to Georgians and they said the same thing about South Ossetia, where yes. like the Russians came in to be a peacekeeping force and then yes. they've held South Ossetia for over a decade. Exactly. And We've even seen this week that essentially uh, Russian allied forces in the Georgian parliament are pushing through legislation yes. that basically would uh, force 
NGOs and organizations to be declared like foreign actors or foreign influencers. That was defeated by the Georgian parliament after massive protests. But like we've seen the, we've seen the influence on Russia on what in English they call their near abroad, like their former yes. Soviet states. So, but you said something that caught my ears I wasn't aware of. So who lives? Are there any civilians that remain in the Gorno Karabakh or have they all been pushed out? Well, after the second uh, Karabakh war, uh, Russia started to uh, return the Armenian refugees to Karabakh. Hmm. Uh, Russia never returned Azeri refugees to Karabakh. Till now, not a single Azeri family has been returned. Or, uh, or is in Karabakh. And the reason they've been doing it for, uh, in the official language in Karabakh is Russian and Armenian. We have uh, credible information that Russia has been giving out uh, Russian passports in, to the population currently they resided in Karabakh. Uh, Russia is uh, s- providing uh, weapons. Russia created its own army there called uh, local Karabakh army, Karabakh army there. Everybody believes that. Everybody knows that uh, Russia is behind it. Um, Russia, that there are some, uh, according to Azari sources, there are 18,000 soldiers there, um, illegal uh, armed uh, forces in Karabakh, also created by Russia. So, Exactly, like in Georgia, uh, South Abkhazia. I mean, the idea, the uh, purpose is, like in Georgia, to bring their own person to the government, uh, to to take over c- completely over the leadership of the country, uh, like it did in Ukraine. That's exactly what they were doing in, in Georgia last week. This foreign agents law. Uh, is, is, is so that uh, there is no civil society left in the country to show resilience against Russian occupation. Now, in Azerbaijan, we don't have foreign agents bill, Nate, but uh, actually we have worse. Uh, our bill was adopted in, I believe, in 2008, which prohibits any whatsoever grants to NGOs in Azerbaijan, any foreign, any European, any Western uh, aid. So we do have no uh, civil society left mm-hmm. in Azerbaijan. We have no free media left in Azerbaijan. It's very easy to control countries like that when there is no resilience, when you cannot say to the government, look, don't lie to us, uh, do not work with Russia, do not be next to aggressor. Like, in Ukraine, for instance, people in Azerbaijan, 100% are with the people of Ukraine. They see it as their war. Mm. They see Putin is attacking their country. They say our own fate is being decided in Ukraine. But can we say it in public? In public? Can we hold demonstrations in capital Baku and say with Ukrainian flags and say that Ukraine will love you or with you? No, we cannot do that. Demonstrations are not allowed in Azerbaijan. When it comes to voting in United Nations General Assembly, how do you think Azerbaijan votes? Does it vote in favor of Ukraine? No. There was a resolution supporting the withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine. Do you know how Azeri diplomats voted? They were in the toilets. We call it toilet diplomacy. Whenever issues like that are decided, Azerbaijan diplomats are hiding in the toilet. Figuratively speaking, of course. So what I'm saying is because there is huge disconnection between the people, people's will and the government, the government goes and does things like that. For instance, last year, 22 uh, February, Ilham Ali went to Moscow and signed an allied cooperation treaty with Moscow. It's unbelievable, just two days before the Russian aggression against Ukraine started. Mm -hmm. We just woke up to those news. We had no idea. How can Russia be our our partner or or ally? (laughs) This is ridiculous. It sells weapons to Armenia. It has a base, military base in Armenia. How can we possibly be allies with Russia? But Ilham Aliyev does that, and the reason he can do that is because it does not have a mandate from the people. Therefore, I believe the solution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is democracy in Azerbaijan and in Armenia. 
Huh. It's interesting to hear you unpack all of that. And it's in particular, you talking about the absence of, of NGOs operating in the country. Uh, the hotel that we stayed at in Baku just happened to be around the corner from the Ministry of Interior. And the Ministry of Interior mm-hmm. uh, is clearly a place in the country that is like well protected and has influence. Like you can tell a lot about a government agency by the building that it's in. And yes. then to your point about support for Ukraine, there's lots of pro-Ukrainian graffiti, uh, but it's largely street art. It's not more public displays like we saw in Georgia. Like Georgia is more outwardly supportive of Ukraine and the conflict. So really fascinating. Yes, absolutely. So Uh, mm -hmm. go ahead, please. Well, Minister Affairs is a whole big topic. I mean, uh, is is against uh, repressions, is behind all those repressions against activists, uh, youth, uh, journalists, rights activists. Uh, For instance, now we have this rights defender, Bakhtar Rajiv, in prison, and he was put in prison by the Minister of Interior. He does not, they do not even conceal that, that they, they can get into your phones, you know, leak your photos, your conversations, so on and so forth. The body that is meant to defend law, to be in the protection of law, the call law enforcement is actually itself uh, uh, doing this, uh, all, all these uh, crimes. Uh, as far as the uh, Georgia, I mean, absolutely, even though Georgia does not support sanctions against uh, Russia, but at least a uh, Georgian president can openly say that, look, our territories have been occupied by Russia, that Russia is moving towards Belize every year closer and closer. Unfortunately, our president cannot say that. He cannot say Karabakh is Azerbaijan. He cannot say, uh, Russia, you, are, you should not be here. Like uh, Russian so-called peacekeepers have been uh, are in Azerbaijan only with five years mandate and half of this mandate is already passed. I don't really believe if Ali is still in power in two and a half years, uh, he will be he will have the courage to tell the Russians enough is enough. Ivan, go home. I really doubt that. Uh, We'll take a break here. And when we come back, uh, I want to return to the optics of the conflict and get your take on uh, how the conflict is seen outside of the region and the United States in particular. So we'll be back. Hey, listeners, this is producer Doug at Channel 253. Hey, we've introduced a new membership level. It's not for everyone, but for those of you who are interested and can afford it, it's a Tacoma level membership. It's $253 a year. Did you get that? Two five three. Two five three. And it really helps us move forward. We don't have a corporate sponsor this year because, as Nate has pointed out, corporate sponsors aren't particularly interested in policing and white supremacy and talking about those issues. So we really rely upon our listeners who are members. And if you can move up to that Tacoma level of membership, you get all the benefits you get with membership. And you're helping us a great deal. Yeah, I think it's really important as much as possible that we put our money where our values are and what we believe in. And like this is not a big operation and it doesn't take a lot of support to keep this going. But like we need your support. And so I would just ask if you've listened to the show for a long time, if you've gotten value from the show, if you've interacted with the show, you you enjoy the show and not just my show, shows across the network, uh, consider becoming a member at the Tacoma level. It really helps sustain us. Thank you. And we are back. I have a big announcement today. Uh, We're announcing the next Nerd Farm Reads Book Club selection. We're going to be reading They Knew How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent by Sarah Kenzior. Uh, Sarah Kenzior is the author of The View from Flyover Country, and she's a journalist who is an expert on authoritarian states. And one of the things I love about Kenzior's writing is, is that she will take things that we see happen in authoritarian states and then compare them to things that we see happen in America and then use that to help people understand how American leaders adapt and adopt the actions of authoritarian leaders. And so go and grab this book. You can get it from King's Books, your local library, or Libro FM, and start reading and sharing your thoughts. If you want to tweet about it, use hashtag NerdFarmReads, or join us on the member Slack. That's where most conversation is happening. All right, let's get back to the conversation. So, so something I was... I, the, the impetus for this conversation is the way that I've heard this issue covered in, like, my own life. Uh, I have... I listen to a podcast called Popular Front that's hosted by a British gent named... 
named Jake Hanrahan, and Jake has had uh, at least four episodes about this conflict, but every episode is from the uh, Armenian point of view. When I put out online that I wanted to have a conversation about this topic, basically I got lots of responses, but like you're literally the only person with from an Azeri point of view uh, who was able and willing to come on to the show. Essentially, there's a bunch of Armenian folks lined up to be on the show, and something I think about is, is that... The Armenian diaspora in the U.S. is significant. Like the Kardashians are Armenians. They've been in the country for hundreds of years. And Armenians are Christians. And America is more sympathetic to Christians kind of in general in conflicts. Um, And so what I want to do is I want to paint how I was taught by media, how this conflict is. And then I'd love to have you say how you view it, if that makes sense. Sure. So the version of the conflict that I understand and that I've been told by media basically is, is that the Azeris are the aggressors. And that the Azeris have rolled into Nagorno-Karabakh and are trying to snatch land from Armenia that should be Armenians. Sorry, Armenian land. But, like, I know it's more complicated than that. So how do you perceive the conflict? Well, it depends uh, who says that and when, because it changed so much. Uh, For 30 years, uh, and I mean from... 90s till 2020, uh, there's approximately 30 years period. Uh, obviously, it was Armenia, the aggressor, uh, no issues there uh, because they have been holding or occupying. You can use different words, but uh, let's mm-hmm. put it like uh, neutral uh, n- n- neutral words, like they were in control of uh, Karabakh and also seven uh, adjacent regions of Azerbaijan. So uh, nobody recognized this occupation those 30 years. Now, 2020 war changed that uh, because diplomatic uh, talks did not yield any results and Armenia did not uh, pull out, did not withdraw its forces. So the war uh, took place. Uh, we call it Second Karabakh War. Uh, as a result of that war, uh, those seven adjacent regions were returned to Azerbaijan. And also the Karabakh, the most part of the Karabakh, but the heart of the Karabakh, say administration, uh, those Khan Kendi, Hojala, et cetera, they're all still uh, in Armenian, Armenians control that. But actually not Armenians, as I as I told, told you earlier, it's actually Russians <laughs> uh, are sure. in control. So uh, those two years, uh, that passed from 2020 war, there were other skirmishes, fights, and uh, I myself did not support those uh, fights. I thought that it was wrong um, to have those fights because they were pa- taking part, first of all, not in Karabakh, but in Arme- in the border between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Some claim that in the Armenian, sovereign Armenian Republic territory. So I was not supporting that. And, the, you know, there was a huge government campaign calling us traitors uh, that were not supporting the government line, so on and so forth. So this is my view. So obviously there, indeed, some may claim that it was aggression by Azerbaijan, those uh, border fights. So... Something that I was reading about doing show prep is there's a group called the – it's the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And essentially it's like Russia's answer to NATO. And I've I've heard you say it, but like I'm really fascinated by the – to the extent to which Russia is playing both sides against the middle. So Armenia's government is a signatory to this mutual defense pact with Russia, correct? Yes. But then the Azeri president is essentially a client of the Putin regime, yes? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, so you laugh. Like, so so Ar- Armenia is basically a member of Russia's version of NATO. Yes. And the Russians are giving arms to Armenia in order to fight the Azeris. And yes. the Azeris are led by Putin's boy. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I, exactly. I can't make sense of it. Help sure. me make sense of it, please. I can't. I can't because it's really ridiculous. That that that's the essence of it. Uh, you know, first of all, when you refer to it as Putin's NATO, uh, it's not unlike NATO. You know, everybody Good. fights everybody in that uh, so-called NATO or <laughs> CSTO. Everybody's against each other. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, 
So it's it's a wish of Putin's wish that to turn it into some kind of a NATO. Okay. Um, and and yeah, absolutely. Russia is a player. Russia is a party to the conflict. Russia wants this conflict. Russia wants Azeris and Armenians fight each other. It's as simple as that. Uh, yes, some government. Uh, we we cannot because if if we did have some uh, democratically elected uh, president, uh, he or she would have been taken into consideration that this Azerbaijan realizes it that we should not be siding with Russia. Unfortunately, this is uh, their person, their man sitting in Baku. Uh, all parliamentarians, all key positions are administered, are appointed by Moscow, approved by Moscow. So head of the armed forces in Azerbaijan, the former uh, chief, for instance, Najmet in Sadek of his name, uh, was very close person of Putin's regime. So therefore, it's very hard uh, when, when Armenians, uh, when I see, uh, sometimes I do watch those Armenian shows, as you say, some of them propaganda, etc. Mm -hmm. I really think of them, are they, do they, is it really hard to understand the situation? I mean, if I understand it, I'm sure there are journalists like me or civil society in Armenia that do understand it. Uh, the only way to solve this is not to arm, is not to spend millions and millions to get, you know, latest drones, etc. Is to come sit at the table and talk to each other. Uh, and to realize that, you know, Russian so-called peacekeeping or Russian so-called mediation is not going to yield anything. We're going to be fighting each other. We had two wars. We're going to have 20 more wars if we don't break that. It's just as simple as that. I know that Pashinyan, the prime minister in Yerevan, is trying to somehow resonate this. And I like that. Uh, I was very critical of Pashinyan before before the Second Karabakh War. Uh, he was going to those occupied territories, to Shusha, uh, dancing there, etc. cetera. We, we, me and myself and other were very critical of Pashinyan. But after the Second Karabakh War, of course he had his own reasons. I'm not saying it's because he's such a peaceful guy, so on and so forth, but he came to realization that Moscow wants to uh, topple him down, wants to get rid of him. So it's a good thing that he understands that. It good, it's a good thing that he's trying to deliver, to convey this message to his people. In fact, I believe that the very fact that Pashinyan stayed in power after such a huge defeat was itself a manifestation that people wanted peace. That they don't really give a damn to Karabakh, you know, who, who controls it, so on and so forth. They want to leave it in the past. So I like that about. Um, and I want the same kind of attitude from Azeri government because it's easy. You say that you go to a restaurant and you see this in all the bills, it's sort of Karabakh in Azerbaijan. But mm -hmm. this is one thing is to say that. The other thing is that when you come to your own life, you want jobs, you want future for your kids. You wanna to go to Europe, to America. You know, you, you, go, you want to have a good pension, so on and so forth. Nobody wants to fight. Nobody's gonna tell you this. Right? But the truth and the reality is one thing is when you're sitting in front of the camera, in front of the monitor or computer or iPhone and pretend that you're such a patriot that you will go and fight and so on and so forth. And the other thing is that when this letter comes to your home and says that you have to go to the war, nobody wants to fight. So therefore, I think it's the same with Azerbaijan, Armenia, United States, you're everywhere. You raise your sons to have a good future, have a good job, so on and so forth. You don't raise your sons. I'm mother of two kids myself, two boys, by the way. You don't raise them to go die to be martyr like my father was. I, I don't want that. I want a good future for my life. So therefore, you have to understand that you have to leave this conflict in the past. You have to, and this is a really great time to do that. It's a historic time because Russia is now weakening. 
Putin is weakening. They withdrawn his forces from Karabakh. There are less forces left in Karabakh. Why? Because they are fighting in Ukraine. So let them do that. Let him defeat, you know, let him die. Let this regime die. And this is a good opportunity for all people in Azerbaijan and Armenia to realize it and finally sit down at the table and say, look, we fought and enough is enough. That's it. Let's leave it in the past. We don't want any more martyrs. We want peace. It's doable. I hate those people who say that, no, we still have this proposal. No, we have to agree on that. That nobody cares. I mean, look at Karabakh. There's not even enough oil. Not, no, there's no oil, no gas, no natural resources there. This, this territory, I mean, there, is, there are no plants, nothing. It's a great territory in a way. They want security, give them security. They want the rights, give them right. Some kind of status, it does not have to be, as long as it is not an independent country, because not the way Russians want it. Russia wants it to be independent country, so that to annex it to its own territory. As long as it does not have its weapons, its army, as long as they're not gonna be bombing us and not fighting us, let them have whatever they want. Let's sign this peace deal. That's what I was telling in my programs. That's why I had this huge trolls coming and attacking me. You're a traitor. You don't want us to fight, blah, so on and so forth. Because I see the propaganda and I see the reality. I see the truth. I, I see that people want a good life. So you made a transition that I wanted to make. I wanted to kind of move to your own journalism. So let's have that conversation for a bit. Uh, can you help me understand like what you do journalistic wise? So like you're based in the United States and you're covering issues back in Azerbaijan. And so like, what is your platform like? Who is your audience like? And how long have you been doing it? Well, I've been doing it for five years now. Uh, and uh, I have half a million um, subscribers, you know, approximately four or five million viewers every month. And it's Azeris mostly. My most mm -hmm. uh, audience is in Azerbaijan, but also in Russia. There are speakers in Russia, in Turkey, indeed all over the world. And um, I cover news as I see it. And, uh, you know, foreign news as I understand it, whenever they are important for the country, for the region. So I interview a lot of opposition, politician, you know, civil society people, journalists, myself. Um, it's, it's, it's important for us because, you know, independent media is really dead in Azerbaijan. No journalists left. If you're in Azerbaijan, you cannot, I could not possibly do what I'm doing now in Azerbaijan. Uh, they would find a tank in my home, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would be in prison. In fact, there was some criminal cases against me, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, from American point of view, it's nothing. I'm doing it from my own home uh, whenever I want to. But uh, for Azerbaijan, it's a big deal. It's a voice. It's a neutral or objective or uh, independent from government view uh, to be heard. So I, I believe it's important. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I just want to thank you for bringing that voice to my show and having this conversation. I learned a lot from you. This is an area of the world that I'm very curious about. And I think part of it is that like living over here in Abu Dhabi, that it's just much closer. Like when you're in the United States, it's very far away. But from here, it's a two hour flight. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm going to continue visiting the Caucasus. We're heading to Armenia next. And I'm going to continue learning about this conflict and these stories. So thank you so much for teaching me. Thank you for having me. Uh, if people want to follow your YouTube channel or find you on the socials, where can they look? Osman Gaze. Uh In YouTube, in Facebook, Instagram, it's Osman Gaze, my pen name. Okay. Uh, and would you spell that just for listeners, please? It's O-S-M-A-N-Q-I-Z-I. -I. All right. Thank you so much again for making time for this. I really, truly learned a lot from you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Wakanda forever, y'all. Convict the police that killed Manuel Ellis. Go Sounders. And the Portland Timbers are and will always be terrible. We out. Channel 253 is a member-supported podcast network. I'm producer Doug Mackey, and I'm asking you to become a member and show your support. Go to channel253.com slash membership to join. Thank you. Nerd Farmer is part of the Channel 253 podcast network. 
Check out our other shows. Interchangeable White Ladies, Give Me the Mic, We Art Tacoma, Move to Tacoma, Taco Man, Flounder's B Team, Crossing Division, Citizen Tacoma, and What Say You? We'll be reading Sarah Kin's yours. Oh, crap. Hold on. What's the name of the fucking book? Hold on. This is Channel 253.